My investigation into the Battle of L.A. incident, uh, the incident that occurred on February 25th, 1942, was something that I've always wanted to do. I've been fascinated by this case for many years, as many people have. But like a lot of the cases I've investigated historically, I felt like it really didn't have enough deep dive as far as the level of detail and information that I felt could be gleaned from the case. So uh, in my research efforts, uh, I tracked down uh, a lot of the declassified government documents, which I might add was through the assistance of veteran UFO researcher Barry Greenwood. Uh, in the late 70s and early 80s, he actually acquired all of these declassified documents, and many researchers haven't taken the time to go through all of those. And what I had done was take those documents and correlate those with the original news clippings, newspapers from that morning and the subsequent days after the events on February 25th, 1942, and then correlated that in turn with the CBS radio news broadcast. And what transpires as a result of correlating all that information is it gives us a clearer picture as to what was going on that morning. Uh, what many people don't know, which many of the UFO skeptics never touch on with regard to this case, is there was not only tens of thousands of witnesses in the greater LA area to this event, there was also radar confirmation. Three separate radar stations in the declassified government documents tracked an inbound unknown radar target moving in 120 miles off the West Coast towards the greater LA area. And this is something the skeptics never want to touch on because the skeptics like to attribute this sighting to a weather balloon or a barrage balloon that was tethered and broke loose. And that's what was photographed and that's what was sighted. And speaking of the photograph, I have new information with regard to the photograph. This case is now 75 years old, which is one of the reasons I'm lecturing on it this year, uh, is the fact that it is the 75th anniversary. But we have new insights into the famous photograph. The photo that most people are familiar with regarding this case shows an unknown object in a convergence of searchlights with little explosions or any aircraft bursts around it. What many people don't know is that that photo was doctored, it was touched up to print essentially better in newsprint when it went to the news services. Uh, what I've been able to do through the assistance of another researcher is actually gather the original negative. I have a high resolution scan of the original negative before it was touched up, before it was doctored. And I got that through the assistance of a UFO researcher friend and colleague, uh, Ben Hansen. And Ben was able to obtain a high resolution scan. And what I do is I, I dive into that and we analyze the original negative knowing that that has not been doctored, that had not been touched up. This was prior to any of the uh, modifications, if you will, of the original photo. So we're going to analyze that, and that's something that, to my knowledge, no one else has ever done. They always look at the doctored photo, which admittedly you really can't glean much from that. So we're going to go to the original negative, we're going to look at the original government documents, and we're going to correlate that with all the original newspapers that I have in my possession from that morning and try to paint a clearer picture of what transpired. And you know, I can't definitively say what was seen on that morning on February 25th, 1942, but I think we can, with fair degree of certainty, rule out all the prosaic explanations that have been thrown out there. Many people, in regards to the Battle of LA incident, write it off as something Japanese, that the Japanese were attacking or it was a reconnaissance plane that was sent over the greater LA area. What many people don't know is at the conclusion of World War II, we have an official declaration by the Japanese military stating they had no military operations along the West Coast near LA on February 25th, 1942. Now what's interesting is they had 36 hours before a Japanese sub surfaced just north of the greater LA area up near Santa Barbara, which fired a number of rounds, uh, deck rounds, into an oil refinery near Santa Barbara. But that had nothing to do with the uh, subsequent events that occurred 36 hours later. And again, we have the uh, declaration by the Japanese military, official statement stating they had no military activity. And in fact, we have one of the officers that was on board that submarine in the early mid-70s who documented and made, wrote a statement to the effect that the, uh, the submarine that waged the attack 36 hours before went back out to the Pacific and had no involvement in the later events that occurred. And then when we look at the object in question, and I kind of go with the hypothesis that it was one solitary object that was basically being looked at and observed on that morning. There were a number of conflicting reports, but all of the data seems to suggest there was one anomalous object. When we look at the flight characteristics of this object, 
at the conclusion, the military investigators came up with the idea that the object moved too slowly to be an aircraft, therefore it must have been a balloon. But when we look at that, there were over 1,400 rounds of any aircraft bursts fired at this thing, in, in addition, I might add, to 50 caliber rounds and 37 millimeter rounds. Any balloon would have been shredded with that amount of shrapnel and metal being thrown at it. Um, and so you look at that, what, what in 1942 could move, quote, slower than an aircraft, unquote, have the ability to hover, as many witnesses described this object doing, and sit there stationary, completely unscathed by this huge amount of weaponry being thrown at it. And in point of fact, the object made one flyby, came in over Santa Monica, Culver City, moved to the southwest of the greater LA area, then dropped down near Long Beach. 20 minutes after that, and by the way, during all of this, it's being tracked in the searchlights and fired on, 20 minutes after the object disappears, it comes back. It comes back over Long Beach, reverses direction, and then goes back out over the Pacific, uh, off of the Santa Monica coastline. So what did we have in 1942? To my knowledge, we had nothing that could perform like that. We had nothing that could sustain the barrage of anti-aircraft fire. And at the end of this, the military had conflicting explanations. Some stated that, well, it, there was nothing there. It was all due to jittery war nerves. Yet other military officials were stating that there were as many as 15 enemy planes in the air on that particular morning. And they never, ever established a conclusive, solitary explanation. Uh, the war effort continued. We won World War II. Life went on. And this case was virtually forgotten until around 1966, 1967, when uh, a UFO magazine actually kind of rekindled the interest in this case. And uh, there was an article written by Kenneth Larson on the Battle of LA incident. And then much later, it was written up in a book. And then subsequent to that, several books uh, then wrote up case scenarios or summaries of what transpired on that morning. But now, you know, armed with all of this insight, on the 75th anniversary of the event this year, uh, we're going to kind of take a look at all of that information, weave it together, and then, as I mentioned, look at new information with regard to the photograph as well as the photographer, which is something that's always been somewhat of a mystery, who took the photograph. I think with about 90% certainty, I, I've established who the photographer was that took the famous photo. With regard to the Battle of L.A., a lot of skeptics as well as uh, UFO believers and military historians have attributed the series of incidents to uh, military planes. Well, uh, as mentioned previously, the Japanese military ruled out their planes as an explanation. We had an official declaration on the part of the Japanese military that there were no military operations in that area on that particular morning. More specifically, a lot of people attributed the fact that perhaps individuals in the greater LA area observed United States fighter pilots that were flying planes at that time. Uh, one of the important factors with regard to that is there was a blackout ordered around two o'clock in the morning as a prelude to the series of incidents that were going to play out, and that was triggered by the inbound radar target. But uh, there was always a mystery. Uh, people claimed that they saw fighter planes in the air, and we have, through the declassified government documents, uh, correspondence between two army generals. One of them uh, states, matter-of-factly, that they did not dispatch any fighter planes. Their rationale at the time, again, before all the information was able to be analyzed later, they felt that this solitary object that had come into the greater LA area was perhaps a Japanese reconnaissance plane. They did not want to dispatch, and they only had 45 fighter planes defending the West Coast at that time, as documented in the government documents. They did not want to dispatch those 45 planes and have them in the air for an extended period if this was just a reconnaissance plane. They wanted to ensure that when the full attack, if the full attack was following this, their planes would be able to be sent up and be fully fueled to defend the West Coast. So that was always a mystery. You know, why didn't they send planes up? And uh, that was the rationale. The memorandum between these two generals also states that pilots were in the cockpits, the planes were fueled up, they were ready to take off, but they were awaiting this full-scale invasion that fortunately never occurred. When we look back to this incident, you know, looking back now 75 years, a lot of people look back at, look back at the events with kind of a tongue-in-cheek attitude, kind of a smirk. And of course, there was a movie, uh, you know, 1941 that basically was a, a parody of these events. But 
It, it is important to point out that there were individuals that lost their lives on that morning as a result of all this ensuing chaos. There were a number of heart attacks as a result of the air raid sirens and the anti-aircraft fire that was exploding in the skies in and around LA. And there were also some vehicular accidents, people that were driving during the blackout, which they ran into other vehicles or they ran into lamp posts and things of that nature. So at least five to six people lost their lives. And I don't think that we should ever you know, ignore that fact. Um, but over the years, we have had other individuals that were there that morning. There was one that I've actually interviewed several years ago that was an eyewitness to those events. Uh, he, along with his mother, awoke that night to the sound of anti-aircraft sirens and anti-aircraft bursts. And they remember stepping outside in their front yard and they could see searchlights, they could see explosions. And he said there was something in a convergence of searchlights that they saw. Of course, they didn't know what it was at the time and he was a young boy. But many witnesses have come forward over the years describing what they saw, more often than not, a solitary object in the convergence of searchlights, which is what was described in the radio broadcast from the time, which was captured in the photograph. And so when you have that amount of you know, correlating data or you have that, you know, that testimony that really bolsters each other's, uh, we have to come away with the fact that this was not hallucination, this was not jittery war nerves, and then again, going back to the radar data, there was something solid that was generating a radar return, that was photographed, that was fired on, and 75 years later, we have a lot of data, but as I always like to say, data doesn't equate to answers. But I do think now with 75 years and the amount of information we have, we can definitively establish what this object was not.